Hello and welcome to episode number 67 of the Scottish History Podcast. My name is Owen Innes and this week I want to tell you about quite possibly the worst poet in the world ever and you'll never guess, yes, he comes from Scotland. So join me for episode number 67 of the Scottish History Podcast. Very often on this particular podcast, I talk about great Scottish things. William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, Orkney, the amount of UNESCO World Heritage sites that this amazing country has. However, this week I want to focus on the worst of something. Where Scotland does arguably claim to have the greatest poet and bard in the world, being Rabbi Burns of course, why don't we talk about someone regarded as the worst poet in the world. His name may even have inspired a character in Harry Potter. I refer, of course, to the infamous William Topaz McGonagall. Now, McGonagall was likely born in Ireland in roughly 1825. However, did used to claim at times that he was born in Edinburgh in 1830. His own entry, however, to the 1841 census, he did write Ireland as his place of birth, so we go with that now. During his early life, he and his parents moved around quite a lot, from Glasgow to South Ronaldsey in Orkney, until finally settling in Dundee by 1840. It was in Dundee that he left behind his formal education to follow in his father's footsteps, and then he became an apprentice weaver. However, throughout his training, he took pride in his reading ability and would often be seen reading cheap books, which included many of Shakespeare's works. In July 1846, he was to marry a woman called Jean King, with whom he would have seven children, being five sons and two daughters. From 1846 to 1877, McGonagall somehow was able to continue working as a weaver despite the effects of the Industrial Revolution hitting trades like his very, very hard. During this time, however, McGonagall would often recite passages of Shakespeare to his other shop workers, and in a legendary way, he paid a local theatre owner to allow him to take the lead role in a production of Macbeth. McGonagall was, however, utterly convinced that the actor playing Macduff was extremely jealous of him and that McGonagall refused to die at the climax of the play. But it was in 1877 when McGonagall's life changed. One of his two daughters gave birth to an illegitimate child which was to bring shame to him and to his family. At this point, he claims to have had an epiphany. He imagined a pen in his right hand and a voice inside him telling him to write poetry. His first poem was titled An Address to Reverend George Gilfillan. Gilfillan was a poor Christian teacher who himself dabbled in writing and poetry. All hail to the Reverend George Gilfillan of Dundee. He is the greatest preacher I did ever hear or see. He is a man of genius bright, and in him his congregation does delight, because they find him to be honest and plain, affable in temper, and seldom known to complain. He preaches in a plain, straightforward way. The people flock to hear him night and day. The hundreds from the doors are often turned away, because he is the greatest preacher of the present day. He has written the life of Sir Walter Scott, and while he lives he will never be forgot, 
nor when he is dead, because by his admirers it will often be read, and fill their minds with wonder and delight, and while away the tedious hours on a cold winter's night. He has also written about the bards of the Bible, which occupied nearly three years in which he was not idle, because when he sits down to write he does it with might and main, and to get an interview with him it would be almost vain. And in that he is always right, for the Bible tells us whatever your hands findeth to do, do it with all of your might. Reverend George Gilfillan of Dundee, I must conclude my muse, and to write in praise of thee my pen does not refuse. Nor does it give me pain to tell the world fearlessly that when you are dead, they shall not look upon your like again. Now, upon hearing this poem for the first time, Gilfillan responded very positively, saying, Even Shakespeare never wrote anything like this. Buoyed by this praise, McGonagall sought a patron for his work, so he aimed as high as he possibly could. He wrote to Queen Victoria. Now, he of course received a letter of rejection, which thanked him, of course, for his interest. Instead, though, McGonagall took this as praise for his work from the Queen. In 1879, he travelled to a meeting of the International Organisation of Good Templars, an organisation that he was a member of that promoted abstinence and straight-edge living. No beer, no drink, no drugs. Here he was mocked and berated by the Chief Templar, who bluntly told McGonagall that his poetry was terrible. McGonagall told the Chief that he was wrong and that Queen Victoria very much approves of his work. Because of this, in July of 1878, McGonagall decided to walk from Dundee to Balmoral to perform for Queen Victoria in person. He walked over 60 miles, that's 97 kilometres, over mountainous terrain and in a very bad storm to reach Balmoral. When he reached the gate, he proclaimed to the guards, I am the Queen's poet. The guards responded, You're not the Queen's poet. Tennyson is the Queen's poet. McGonagall then presented his rejection letter to the cards as his proof that he was the Queen's poet but was sent on his way. He then had to walk all the way back to Dundee. He did, however, continue to write his poetry and wrote reports for local newspapers. Now, as he was still a member of the International Organisation of Good Templars, he continued also to campaign against the drinking of alcohol. Now, this involved him entering pubs and bars to recite poetry against the drinking of the strong drink. On one occasion, a publican threw a plate of peas at McGonagall to show his disdain for him. McGonagall would go on to write in the only book that was released during his life called Poetic Gems of the Incident. McGonagall said, I don't like publicans. The first man to throw a plate of peas at me was a publican. Now, what I do love about this is the way that he says the first man to throw a plate of peas at me, as though it ended up becoming a regular occurrence. In 1883, he wrote about the Tay Whale. Now, this was an incident where a humpback whale was spotted in the River Tay, which is right next to Dundee, the longest river in Scotland as well. Dundee being then the whaling port of Scotland with many whaling vessels in the port at that time for the winter, this was in December, he decided, they decided to hunt the whale in the tay, basically. They managed to harpoon the whale, but the whale was a strong male whale, which then towed two of the rowing boats and two steamboats all the way up the east coast of Scotland to Montrose, and then back down again, back south again, down to the Firth of Forth, obviously just near Edinburgh. Eventually, the harpoon lines broke and the whale managed to escape. A week later, the whale was seen floating dead just off the coast at Stonehaven when it was brought to the shore. The carcass was bought by a Dundee entrepreneur and placed on display until late January 1884. This was when the carcass was too badly decomposed to then be on public display. 
The carcass was then dissected by an anatomy professor called John Struthers, who preserved as much of the whale as he possibly could. The skeleton of the whale is now on display in the McManus Galleries in Dundee, and even a new sculpture made by a man called Lee Simmons has just recently been erected in Dundee to commemorate this incident. William McGonagall's poem, The Famous Tay Whale, is one that is regarded as his worst ever poem. "'Twas in the month of December and in the year 1883 that a monster whale came to Dundee, resolved for a few days to sport and play and devour the small fishes in the silvery tay. So the monster whale did sport and play among the innocent little fishes in the beautiful tay, until he was seen by some men one day and they resolved to catch him without delay. When it came to be known a whale was seen in the tay, some men began to walk and say, we must try and catch this monster of a whale, so come on, brave boys, and never say fail. Then the people together in crowds did run, resolved to capture the whale and to have some fun. So small boats were launched on the silvery tay, while the monster of the deep did sport and play. Oh, it was a most fearful and beautiful sight, to see it lashing the water with its tail all its might, and making the water ascend like a shower of hail, with one lash of its ugly and mighty tail. Then the water did descend on the men in the boats, which wet their trousers and also their coats, but it only made them the more determined to catch the whale, but the whale shook at him with his tail. Then the whale began to puff and to blow, while the men in the boats after him did go, armed well with harpoons for the fray, which they fired at him without dismay. And they laughed and grinned just like wild baboons, while they fired at him their sharp harpoons. But when struck with the harpoons he dived below, which filled his pursuers' hearts with woe. Because they guessed they had lost a prize, which caused the tears to well up in their eyes, and in their anticipations were only right, because he sped on to Stonehaven with all his might and was first seen by the crew of a Gurdon fishing boat, which they thought was a big cobble upturned afloat. But when they drew near they saw it was a whale, so they resolved to tow it ashore without fail. So they got a rope from each boat tied around his tail, and landed their burden at Stonehaven without fail. And when the people saw it in their voices they did raise, declaring that the brave fishermen deserved great praise. And my opinion is that God sent the whale in a time of need, no matter what people may think or what is their creed. I know fishermen in general are often very poor, and God in his goodness sent it drive poverty from their door. So Mr John Wood has bought it for £226 and has brought it to Dundee all safe and sound which measures 40 feet in length from the snout to the tail, so I advise that people far and near to see it without fail. Then hurrah for the mighty monster whale, which has got 17 feet 4 inches from tip to tip of a tail, which can be seen for a sixpence or a shilling, that is to say if the people are all willing. <sighs> In 1887, McGonagall even sailed to New York to try and earn his fortune, but returned with nothing to show. I mean, if that's the type of poem he was coming out with, I'm no surprise. McGonagall then joined the circus. <laughs> it doesn't end there. Here he would read his poems and allow the paying public to pelt him with eggs, flour, herrings, potatoes and evidently plates of peas. The magistrates of Dundee, however, put a stop to his working at the circus due to the almost riots that would occur during his act with the amount of people flocking down to throw stuff at him. This, of course, upset Mr McGonagall, who in turn, you guessed it, wrote a poem in response titled Lines in Protest to the Dundee Magistrates. I'm not going to read that one. In 1890, his one and only book that I mentioned before, Poetic Gems, was published with the help of some of his friends as his financial situations just got worse and worse. 
The sales from the book did manage to keep him afloat for a while, and by 1893, McGonagall started to get pretty pissed off with the way that he was being treated in Dundee, and wrote a poem about it, threatening to leave the city. Many responded that he wouldn't leave until 1893 was done, as 1893 rhymes with Dundee. And it was to be the following year, in 1894, that McGonagall and his wife were to finally be driven from Dundee and they moved to Persia. Once in Persia, McGonagall received a letter sent apparently from King Thibaw Min of Burma. The letter informed him that he had been knighted by the king as Topaz McGonagall, Grand Knight of the Holy Order of the White Elephant Burma. Now he ended up using this name, of course he would, for advertising, of course he would, for the rest of his life, of course he would. Never confirmed, but it was almost certainly a hoax. In 1895, McGonagall and his wife moved once again. This time they moved to number 5, South College Street in Edinburgh. He quickly became a bit of a cult hero for a few years, but by 1900 his health had seriously declined, as had his wallet. Sir William Topaz McGonagall, Grand Knight of the Order of the White Elephant Burma, died penniless at his Edinburgh home, aged 77 on the 29th of September 1902. He was buried at that time in an unmarked grave in Greyfriars Kirkyard. However, in 1999, a new gravestone was placed at his grave in honour of his memory. It reads, William McGonagall, Poet and tragedian, I am your gracious majesty, ever faithful to thee, William McGonagall, the poor poet that lives in Dundee. But McGonagall's legacy lives on, however, through many mediums. As I mentioned before, right at the beginning, J.K. Rowling used McGonagall's name for her professor, Minerva McGonagall, in her Harry Potter series of books. But by far my favourite were paid by the brilliant Spike Milligan. First of all, in a show called The Goon Show, which if you've never heard, get it on. It's on Spotify, um, it's on uh, BBC Sounds, there's an app called BBC Sounds. Type in The Goon Show, it'll have you laughing for hours. I've listened to every single one of them uh, when I was working night shift last year and I was in absolute hysterics sometimes, dropping milk off at people's doors. Uh, it is incredible. But so with Spike Milligan in The Goon Show, there was the name William McGoonagall, poet, tragedian and twit. And also a brilliant spoof of McGonagall's life actually, which was made once again by Spike Milligan in a film called The Great McGonagall. And Spike plays McGonagall himself and Peter Sellers plays Queen Victoria. So folks, what a very interesting character William Topaz McGonagall was and this has been an episode that I've kind of flirted with for a while but uh, it is coming up to I'm going to be marrying this one up to another episode uh, that's going to come out fairly fairly shortly so and uh, you'll understand why when we get there so folks thank you very very much for listening once again um, I'll just quickly run through the social media channels and everything like that if you want to get in touch with me, you can do so via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Just send me a message on there. The best way to get in touch with me, however, is on my uh, email. So email scotthistorypod at gmail.com. If you wish to support the podcast in any way, you can do so via Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash scotthistorypod. And you can also find links to everywhere that you can find this podcast on the website scotthistorypod.com. Once again, folks, thank you very much for listening, and I will see you again next time. <laughs>